Colleagues, attention please. Uh, dear Mr. Nikolov, uh, Vice Minister of uh, Education and Science, uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, it is my pleasure to welcome you, all of you, uh, to Russia, to the University of Russia, at the 18th edition of the Conseil Conference. Today the weather is uh, very well. Uh, the sun is shining strongly, but uh, the air condition uh, is working also very hard. Uh, there, is, uh, there are a lot of conditions for successful conference. As usual, our conference will begin with about 10 minutes beautiful music. Uh, let me introduce the Cherkin Quartet uh, to you. Uh, our short uh, concert uh, will start uh, with a piece of Mozart. Uh, please uh, turn off your smartphones and enjoy the music. If you want, you can also sing or whistle. <laughs> Thank you. 
It's my pleasure to give the floor to the, uh, Mr. Nikolov, Vice Minister of uh, Education and Science, to open the conference. защото аз съм човек тежко увреден с хуманитарно образование. Посветил съм години от живота си да уча непотребни неща, като латински, старогръцки и други подобни. I have dedicated uh, a lot of years um, to study um, subject courses like uh, Latin, um, Old um, Greek, which are useless. But the things that you are interested in and that are interesting to me, I hope that there are no Chinese in the room. And it sounds like a Chinese. And the things which are your focus and which uh, are very interesting to me sound to me like Chinese. I hope there are not Chinese people among the audience, but <laughs> yes, there are. Uh, Смартфона ми и с компютъра ми по-добре, отколкото се справям аз. At the same time, looking at how things develop in our lives and looking at the way my daughter works on her smartphone, 
I am aware that things are changing quickly. Така че светът се променя. И колкото и да харесваме и да уважаваме миналото, особено в град като Русе, трябва да се дадем ясна сметка за това. So the world changes and uh, this comes particularly relevant to uh, a place like Rusy, which is a town of traditions, but still things are moving and developing, so we should be aware of this. Аз принадлежа на поколението, което видя една технологична революция с учите си. Моето детство мина без интернет, без мобилни телефони, без този бърз пряк начин да общуват хората от всички краища на планетата. I belong to the generation which experienced the growth of information and telecommunication technologies. In my childhood I have spent my years without smartphones, without computers, without this fast way which we see now in communication among people. Когато четем фантастичните романи на старите автори, ще видим, че за началото на 21 век те предвиждат разходки до Луната, до други планети, телепортации, но никой не осъзнава революцията, която компютърната технология и възможността просто хората да общуват помежду си доведе. If we focus on uh, science fiction books, we will see that they tell the stories of visiting other planets, traveling in space, but uh, nobody has uh, even thought that uh, today we will be able to communicate so quickly due to technologies that we have. Preto учите ни света се променя, бизнесът се променя, економиката се променя, а това означава и че образованието също трябва да започне да се променя. Nowadays we see that the world is changing very quickly. At the same time, education should also change to keep up with the recent developments. Това е убеждение на Министерство на образованието и науката и на Министър на образованието и науката, господин Красимир Вълчев. This is a belief which is shared by the Ministry of Education and Science, and this is a belief which is shared by our Minister of Education and Science, Mr. Krasimir Vulcev. Ние сме сигурни, че модерните технологии че развитието на дигиталния свят отваря огромни възможности пред българското и европейското образование и също времено ни изправя пред заплахата, ако не прескочим в новата епоха, да се превърнем в релит от миналото, подобно на латински и на сърдовецки язик. In the way Greek, old Greek and Latin languages are seen today. За това това е основен приоритет. Тази сфера е основен приоритет на българското правителство, което за пръв път през годините след 89-та година, след падането на Берлинската стена, заяви ясно, че образованието е основният му приоритет. Никога до сега образованието не е поставено в центъра на политика. Нашата цел през следващи някакви години е да изненадаме приятно себе си и света. Винаги, когато гляда в Русе, се срещам за една история и с това ще ви включа. Която ми е много любима. При почти 200 години 
almost 200 years ago. Uh, the Czech champion at the downtime, a world chess champion. Angličané to trofy pojistu Adolf Žitugorsky. The English of Polish origin Adolf Žitugorsky. Uvijeliki Evropa stige do Rusi. Traveling around Europe visit Rusi. Tuk to je pocijat of ein hotel ili samo premisa. Here he stays in a hotel. I večeri ih je. And while he was having dinner. Se srešta s jedin moj narečen čiču. He meets a relative of mine, one of my uncles. His name is Alexander Šišman, or also known as Šišmanvič. They start talking to each other. Žitugorski mu kaza, če je svetož šampion Kušak. Žitugorski čeras pred moj akal, da ti je svetovorod čez čempion. Pri kojeto Šišmanvič režava svoje lepo ovde i izigrate na dve parti. And the Šišmanvič decides that this is a good occasion so that they both play chess together. I dve se završat se s pobeda na Šišmanović. Which ends at the winner of Šišmanović. Kogato se predpribira obratno v Hvonom. So when he goes back to London. Svetovni čempion zapisa podrobno hoda na partijite. The world champion describes the first of development of the chess game. I dnes, usobeno na to odbete, partijata Žitugorski Šišmanović se smijata za klasi šakmati se izlučava od vsegi, koji tu profesionalno se zanimava se šakmati. Svetat je krsiv, zašto to može iznenadva. A ako ima hora, koji tu še ni iznenadva pre sve vrštite kutini, može biti da izkletje, to pa ste vjeti. Za me veš isključitelna čest da ukrija vaše kolme blagodeje.
Please allow me on behalf of the academic community of the University of Russia and on my behalf to welcome you to the 18th edition of the International Comsi State Research Conference. We highly appreciate the efforts of the Academic Society of Computer Systems and Information Technologies to have an active scientific life and will support all your research contributions. I'd like to express special gratitude to the conference organizers. We are glad that ComSystem conference is already well recognized and gets more popular in Bulgaria and Europe and all over the world. The fact that today in this hall there are scientists from more than 14 countries is an eloquent evidence for this. Another evidence for the attractive power and the level of the conference is the fact that for the last 10 years the consistent papers have been published in the digital library of the Association for Computing Machinery, the most prestigious organization in the field of computing and are indexed by Scopus. I wish all participants in the conference beneficial and successful work and may the conference achieve its aims. I hope you will feel like home at the University of Russia. At this we will do our best. Thanks a lot, Professor Betcher. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, as you know, Mrs. Georgiana Bussi is the founder and the president of the Digital National Alliance. She has uh, sent to us a great address. Let's hear it. Dear Madam Director of Russia University, dear uh, President of the General Assembly, dear colleagues and friends, I'm sorry to come here with Julie Lucid, uh, the academic capital of Bulgaria on the Danube River. Still remember the last meeting we had in the autumn of 2015, when you impressed us with the excellent organization, with the um, hospitality of the people there, and of course with the very professional discussions we had. I'm sure that today you will build uh, a comic and manage to, um, uh, to show all the innovative and new projects you are involved uh, now. Due to the fact that uh, the Academic uh, Society of Computing became a collective member of the Digital National Alliance, our team follows with enthusiasm all the activities um, uh, of, uh, of the society. And I must confess that uh, personally, I'm impressed by the fact that you succeeded in uniting almost all the institutes and departments of computing. This is so important to join the establishing the right set of skills, uh, so much needed by industry 4.0. Um, you go even further uh, by promoting digital tools, uh, not only in the universities and in the colleges of Bulgaria, but also uh, in our educational system. And uh, the Digital National Alliance will be very supportive in doing this jointly. Having said that, uh, let me um, 
wish you another great and successful event to you as organizers and to all your guests. Uh, thank you very much to Mrs. Gagana Pussy. Uh, she is a great uh, friend uh, of our community. Uh, maybe she is uh, watching and, uh, and listening uh, us now in the internet. Hello, Jorgana. Okay. And now uh, we have uh, for you a big surprise. Today, the head of uh, the department of uh, computing at the University of Jose, Zabzal uh, Georgiev, who is uh, my former PhD student and my boss now, <laughs> has a birthday. Around 50 years. Not 15, but 50. <laughs> Dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, I'm very grateful that you came here to our Consiste conference and also by coincidence to my birthday. Thanks to the projects and to the consistent. I probably also belong to the BBC generation. <laughs> the next one will be BBS probably, born before smartphones. <laughs> and probably because next year Consistec will be at the same time, so I would like to invite you uh, once again to join my birthday. <laughs> And this is my personal present to my chef. <laughs> Dear colleagues, uh, before I give the floor to the chair of the um, conference, from Stick, I would like to tell you a very little joke. Do you like jokes? Yes? Okay. Uh, be careful uh, to understand that idea. Okay, the joke. A professor says, says to his colleagues, recently my dreams began to come true. Really, for example, for example, once I dreamed that I was at a conference and when I woke up, what did I see? I was really at, at the conference. <laughs> the colleagues, please don't fall asleep during this conference. <laughs> and now I give the floor to the chairman, 
of the Council Conference, Professor Boris Vachev. Welcome to the Bay Session. So, good afternoon, Agent. Uh, I want to, to open the Bay Session of our 18 conference on computer systems and technology. Today, we have three famous speakers with three famous presentations. The first one is Vladimir Kolvazov. Vlado <laughs> Hesse Oscar for science and his music. For the original concept, design, and implementation of VRA, which is a fully traced rendering for motion pictures. It is a big success for our country. And now, Laura, you are, please. <laughs> I thought that 
was focusing on my studies was probably more important. Um, and he said, okay, um, I'll come back to you later. So he asked me next year when I was uh, in my second year at university, and uh, I agreed. Um, and we worked on a bunch of stuff. Um, I never finished this game, so it's still, uh, it still runs today. It's still in Drupal Scala. I can still run it. It's just not really going anywhere. Um, the first product that we did was a, a plugin for 3D Studio Max. It was called Phoenix, and it was designed to simulate things like fire and snow. It was very really fake. Uh, it wasn't doing anything like uh, fluid dynamics simulations or anything like that, but it looked kind of nice, and it sold a few copies enough to get us started and to figure out that we can actually write commercial software. Um, I also, in my spare time, did another project that was uh, doing a cloth simulation. It was called Simcloth. Um, and I have a few videos from that time. Um, so we kind of did things like this. It wasn't really, again, anything complicated. I was just interested to see how things like this are created. Um, but this project then got me an internship at a company called Havoc in Ireland. And I spent the summer there just to see how commercial software is written. They asked me to stay in Ireland after that, but uh, I just didn't think that was the right thing for me. So uh, I went back to Sofia and started working on E-Ray at the end of 2000. Um, Today, our company is more than 200 people. Um, the main office is in Sofia, so almost all of those people are in Sofia. We have a few other offices in uh, the United States, Japan, South Korea, but they're mostly just marketing and sales offices. Basically, all the development happens uh, in Sofia. Um, Vray itself is just a render engine, but it has more than 10 integrations in, in various other softwares. Uh, we also do a fluid dynamics plugin called Phoenix. It's sort of a, a sequel to the original Phoenix that Peter and I did back then, but it's actually a, a proper fluid dynamics simulator. And it can do, besides fire and it can also do liquids. Uh, VR scans is another technology that we developed for um, scanning surface materials and rendering them. Uh, which was interesting for us because it involves hardware. So we have not only developed the software, but we also use hardware. Um, just a few words about Phoenix AP. Uh, like I said, it's a fluid dynamics simulator. It's mostly designed for uh, film visual effects and TV commercials and stuff like that. This is a, a result from Phoenix. It can simulate not only the movement of the water, but also things like splashes and foam. Uh, and it also includes a method to render the whole thing with, with the Earth. It's also a commercial product, we, we sell it. Um. So all this is computer graphics, there's nothing real in this video. Uh, the VR scans is basically a combination of a hardware device and uh, software for uh, scanning surface materials, hard surface materials like wood, uh, metals. Um, we, we started this project in uh, 2010 and we were really just doing it as a research project. We didn't know whether it's going to work. It was just uh, one of our uh, guys working on the hardware in his basement and another guy doing the software. Um, so the first scanner was basically just built by hand. The second version, we found a company to manufacture it in Japan, and it looks a lot more fancy. Um, I actually have some pictures of that manufacturing process. That's what the scanner is, just a black box, basically, but it contains a bunch of mirrors that allow us to shine light, light from various uh, directions on a piece of material. Uh, there's also a camera. It's, not shown here, but there is a camera that photographs the whole thing. I don't know why this is here, but it's 
Um, here uh, we're trying to ship the scanner from Japan to uh, our Bulgarian office. Um, and it arrived in our office just in time for Christmas. Um, what it does, uh, what are the results of this scanning? Basically, uh, uh, something like this. All the materials here, uh, the objects are uh, CG, they're not real objects, but the materials are uh, scanned pieces of material, like real pieces of cloth and leather and so on. And then we put them on the CG objects to see how that's going to uh, what it will look like. Um, everything here, all the materials are, are scanned with our technology. And it allows us to do some materials which are really not possible to recreate uh, with just regular mathematical formulas like this one. Um, we haven't really found a way to render this type of computer images in any other way besides scanning the actual material. We're actually very proud of this project because it's the first time we've done uh, hardware and it worked fine in the end. But V-Ray is our main product um, and it's what I actually got the, the uh, Scientific Award for. It's a physically based global animation render. What does it mean? It takes a, a 3D model, a computer 3D model, uh, the geometry, the lights, the surface properties, it takes the camera definition and it basically calculates what this camera would see in a virtual world and it tries to produce an image that is as realistic as possible using a technique called ray tracing. Um, I have a few videos to show you kind of what it looks like. So I'm not going to play all of it, but kind of see what our software is used for, especially in movies. Um, it's used for set extensions, it's used for digital actors, it's used for monsters, things that generally don't exist or would be 
just uh, too costly to actually uh, fill in real life. Um, this is a timeline of the development of URA. I mentioned that it started at the end of 2000. Uh, we didn't originally plan to write URA. It started off as another project that we just needed some ray tracing for, but it generally grew into being a full-fledged renderer after that. Um, and right now, in uh, 2017, we are at version 3.5, and there will probably be version 4 very soon. Um, applications of URA besides movies also include architectural visualization. Uh, and when architects create a building, they need to show it to people. Uh, they can't just show blueprints because uh, buyers and investors don't really understand blueprints, so they have to show realistic rendering of that building. Um, it can also be used for interior design. Uh, if you want to see what a space will look like with new furniture, um, things like that. It's also used, URA is used to uh, show new models of cars or even existing cars um, in different configurations um, and it's used for TV work like uh, TV commercials uh, and TV series like Game of Thrones, Arrow and so on. Um, it's actually quite a popular render engine today. If you have been to the cinema this year or if you have watched TV for any amount of time you have seen the you just didn't know it's, um, it's there. This is uh, an interior render, nothing in the image is real, everything is uh, calculated by DRA, by, um, by, uh, by one of our clients. This is just a collage of all the movie posters that DRA was used for until the uh, end of last year. We counted more than 160 movies. They are a little bit more now because there are a few movies that came out this year, like You Can the Beast, Fast and Furious 8. They all used DRA to various extents. Um, right, so some of the challenges that we have while developing VRA, for me specifically, the biggest issue was that we tend to have two types of users. One type of users um, need a very simple piece of software. They don't have a lot of time because they have so many images to produce in a single day. So they need a software that works quickly, has, doesn't have a lot of settings, um, and basically allows it to do everything single place. And the other users, uh, movie uh, companies, uh, people who do TV commercials, usually they want a more advanced piece of software. It doesn't need to be the fastest thing out there, but it needs to be very flexible and very extensible. Um, and it needs to work very well with all the other tools that those customers use because they, they use other things than, um, than V-Ray. And as you can see, the, the requirements of both types of users is for its success and why we actually got awarded uh, a site tech award. Um, there are a few reasons for this. First, we use practical algorithms. Um, we started working on D-Ray so many years ago and it had to produce, like computers back then were not as fast as they are today, but we still had to produce realistic images. So we had to figure out how to do that with the limited computing power. Uh, that users had back then. It also, we tried to make it user friendly, not too many buttons. Uh, it didn't require a lot of technical knowledge from people. Um, it also, the original architecture of the software was quite extensible, so we, we could add new features, expand it over the years without uh, hitting a wall, so we could keep on uh, improving it. Also, uh, and the thing sometimes it's difficult for developers to, to actually do, but we spend some time talking to customers, uh, listening to their feedback, fixing bugs, and so on. There's a, especially with developers, it's, it's a little bit difficult because they don't really like to interact with the actual users. So they write the software, but they don't like to communicate with people and actually use it. And this is because users, of course, try to get their job done. They complain because things are either too slow or crash and so on. And developers obviously don't want to hear all that. Um, but I think it's important for developers to know that all these things because they can go and fix them and find better ways to do things. Uh, because it's after all, it's not users against developers. Everybody's trying to get their job done. So um, we actually have to take uh, users into account. Um, and we also try to keep up with all the new developments that happen all the time, computer graphics changes, uh, the hardware changes, CPUs get more and more cores, 
Um, you can ray trace on the GPU today, things like artificial intelligence and uh, deep neural networks become relevant to computer graphics, and we basically need to uh, keep all this uh, in account and have to keep up with everything. Um, other things we do, we experiment with stuff. Uh, for example, the, the VR scans, the, the scanner that we did basically started as an experiment. We didn't know if it's going to work. It could have also been a failure. Uh, and some things that we did were actually a failure. But you can't succeed without failing at some point. Um, so getting to the second half of my presentation. I studied, I graduated from Sofia University um, in 2001. Uh, I studied informatics and uh, I majored in computer graphics. Um, for me, the university experience uh, was useful to a large extent, but I think it could have been even more useful to prepare me for the job that I had to do afterwards, and this is what I want to talk about. Um, obviously, we started the first year of university started with some basic computer programming courses, but I actually think that, I mean, because I knew programming before I went to university, and I actually think that the university is not the time and place to learn the basics of programming. If you don't know programming by that time, it's probably already too late. Um, there are exceptions, obviously, on people who never heard of computers before uh, until they went to university, and they are great developers today, but there are exceptions and gen generally not the rule. Um, to me, university should really focus on more advanced stuff like mathematics, application of that mathematics. Um, everything, practically everything that I learned turned out to be useful at some point in my career afterwards, but I just didn't know it yet. I'm going to get to this. But things like linear algebra, algebra uh, analytic geometry, calculus, differential equations, all of that was super helpful for me. For me. Um, and then later on, numerical methods, synchronization, and computational geometry. Um, and I know that a lot of my colleagues at university really felt that this is useless and mathematics shouldn't be taught to people who study computer science, but I, I disagree because some of the most interesting problems that you can solve actually involve a lot of mathematics. And you can also uh, always go into web pages and uh, stuff like that. But I, I don't think that that's the point of computer science. Right, so I knew a lot of stuff, but I didn't know a whole lot of other stuff. Um, and some of that I tried to list here. Um, and I'm going to go in more detail uh, for each of these topics. Um, first, at least at Self University, a lot of the, the uh, Professors there really felt that university should be about theory. They thought that practice is something that happens like magically in the real life, but nobody needs to know that. Um, and it's not actually the truth, right? I didn't actually, nobody cared to explain to us what are the practical applications of any of the mathematics that we actually learned at a time. So, for example, I didn't know why it's important for me to get up at 6 a.m. on a Monday morning to go and listen to three boring lectures of differential equations. Um, and that's why I mostly slept through with them. But then I had to use differential equations in my work and I had to relearn a lot of that stuff on my own. And it would have been very helpful if I had paid more attention. Nobody actually cared to explain why I need to pay attention. And the same is true for numerical methods. Basically, the whole rendering problem, uh, problem theory itself, all it tries to do is solve uh, an integral equation. And you can apply a lot of, if you know this, you can apply a lot of mathematical methods that already exist. And you can just take them and apply it to your code, and it works. But I didn't know that, so I had to just basically reinvent a lot of stuff that people have been doing for uh, decades. Um, other things that I was really not prepared for was uh, I didn't know anything about practically writing software. I knew how to program, obviously, um, but I didn't know how you build soft how you build software as a as a product. How you um, because it's not just somebody sitting down and typing code in the room. Uh, it doesn't work like that in real life. So I didn't know anything about version control systems like Subversion and Git. My version control system was basically me making zip files of all the code and sending them to my Yahoo email account. 
uh, with a password that I forgot and now they're there, but I don't know how to extract. So if I had known that uh, there are version control systems, this problem would have been solved. Um, I didn't know anything about unit testing. Of course, at some point, I realized that we needed to test new versions of our software, that we need to keep everything working. And we started making unit tests, but I didn't know anything about this when I graduated. Um, I didn't know anything about bug tracking systems like Mantis or uh, Jira, uh, or ticketing systems or code reviews, anything like that. I didn't even know how you build complex programs. Like everything that I've ever done was uh, press compile and Google Pascal and the program will come out. I didn't know that there are uh, build systems like CMake or Visual Studio or anything else. And it would have been super helpful for me if I had known this. Um, and yeah, that, that's the last point that I made is that uh, in the first few years while I worked as a developer, I had time to figure all this on my own, but um, at least computer graphics is recently a very competitive market. So if you don't know this stuff, if you just try to figure things on your own, it's not going to end well. Um, a little more technical details that I wish I knew university, basically how compilers and linkers work. When we started programming, we were basically never went into details. The compiler just did some magic and programs run. But nobody ever cared to explain what happens under it, with like virtual functions, uh, how the heap works, new and delete operators, all that stuff that you need to know when you write a very highly performant code. Uh, Rendering is a, is a very slow process. One, rendering one single frame, one single image can take many hours. Um, in the best case, it could be one hour. In the worst case, it could be tens of hours for more complicated stuff. And making this fast is very important for our users. And you have to know how the compiler works and uh, how to implement things efficiently. You can't just think that some, by some magic everything will be fine. Um, Multi-threaded programming was also something that I had to learn on my own. Uh, it was funny because when we did the first Phoenix, I was fairly uh, advanced with the development and then we gave it to some users uh, in Bulgaria to try it out and they said, well, it doesn't work on this dual CPU machine that we have. And I didn't even know you could put two CPUs in one machine. <coughs> Which for a person coming out of university was totally inexcusable. Even phones today have multiple cores. And the, the sad thing is that we see people uh, applying for jobs at our company that don't know anything about uh, multi-threaded programming either, uh, which is just sad. I think it should be something that you learn at university. Uh, networking code, I know that, that there have been elective courses at Sophie University. Um, I wish I had taken them, but I didn't. So that's something that I have to learn like, about basics of TCP. HTTP, not that I would write a whole HTTP implementation from scratch, but I need to know how that stuff works. Um, I didn't know about anything about just the model, the way in which you develop software. We, we actually had just one single course on software development as a process. Uh, unfortunately, it was very outdated and I, uh, it was not really usable in practice. But if I had known about all the different approaches like Agile, Scrum, versus Waterfall would have been super helpful for me to start uh, our development. And we eventually figured all this out, but still a lot of errors along the way. Um, also, um, I didn't know that, I didn't know that uh, anything about continuous integration, about doing daily builds, or in our case, nightly builds. Basically, the way I did our nightly build system was because I was uh, tired of just giving builds to customers who had problems. Like, I would complain that there was a bug or something. I would sit down, compile a new build, upload it, put them on an FTP server for them to download. And of course, when you can do it for one customer, but when you start to have 10, 20 customers, you keep doing this and it gets very tedious. So that's why I had to sit down and write our own uh, build system that would compile a new version of URA every single night. That's why the whole night of it. Um, but if I had known to do this right from the start, things would have been a lot easier. Um, things that we didn't know anything about, software licensing and protection. Again, this is something that when you write and code in university, you just think that this sort of thing happens on its own and people just give you money for things that you write, but that's not the real world. Um, so 
how do you keep track of the licensing, how do you protect your software from being used illegally, these are things that we had to figure on our own. And of course it took a few efforts, we've had cracks for VRA for a long time. Uh, we're now at a point where we haven't had a crack of VRA in maybe six months and we are very happy about it. But of course it's only a matter of time. Um, I didn't know how to organize our development. In the beginning it was just me and Peter, so everything was fine, but then we started getting more people. Um, and I didn't know how you organize software development. I didn't know that you need to have QA people, that you need to have support. Of course, these, if you think about it, these are things that are logical, but I had no idea that you had to do that. If we had known this in the beginning, it would have been easier for us, because when you try to do things, um, as you are working at the same time, it's just, it's just difficult to uh, get more people and to get them to work together, and so on. Um, so I didn't know anything about and Of course, this is a little bit more, my position is a little bit unique because I'm not only a developer, but I also have to manage one part of our company. And for me, it was a difficult uh, process because I had to learn with, to work with people. Um, unfortunately, I'm developers are not naturally community, like they don't talk to each other a lot, so it's a skill that I had to learn, um, and I wish I had at least some pointers uh, on how this is done, and of course there are, there are lots of books and lots of approaches to that, but at least some form of how you organize and manage teams with people, at least some sort of education would have been very helpful for me. Um, right, and I mentioned that there are two new areas that become more and more important. I just wanted to mention them. I see and I'm, I'm very happy that many of the talks at uh, this conference here are related to artificial intelligence and uh, there's even one on GPU programming, I think, which is very nice for me to see. But anyway, I didn't, for example, at university, I had to choose between artificial intelligence and computer graphics. But it's come to a point where it's not one or the other, it's both. You need to know both and specifically Deep learning is becoming a topic that's applicable to basically everything, all aspects of, of computing, not just computer graphics, but everything. And we'll come to a point where artificial intelligence will basically take over all of the work that we do. So, uh, luckily for me, I've already uh, done enough, but for new people out there, it might be difficult to find jobs because, yeah, everything will be AI at some point. Um, GPUs. They, they are interesting because they, they require a, a totally different approach to programming. They are massively parallel. It's not like you write a sequential program and uh, then it just magically becomes parallel. And we, new developers that come to our company usually have difficulty adjusting to this type of, you just have to think in a different way. And just being exposed to, to the fact that such uh, approaches to programming exist at university would have been very helpful. Like even if you don't end up doing GPU program, just knowing that it's there and just trying to solve a few problems uh, on GPUs efficiently, it just opens up a whole other world, another way of thinking. Um, right, so this is almost the end of my talk. I would just like to play our uh, demo reel for uh, last year. Just a bunch of nice images to look at. Always photorealistic stuff that can be used for other things as well. The tiger is to CG.
Има въпроси, искам само да отрежа нещо. Има, има. Въпроси има. Няма въпрос, искам само да отбележа нещо. Ако ние преподавателите по ICT знаем всичко това, на което Владимир би искал да сме го научили, може би някой от нас ще изгледаме от скара. I have a brief question. Uh, of course, if it is not a secret, could you tell us a few words about uh, the funding uh, you have received throughout the years? Do you have investors? Um, general, what kind of funding do you use? Um, well, it's a, it's a, uh, it was a little bit of an usual situation for us because we didn't actually get any external funding <coughs> except a uh, little bit of investment from Peter's parents to buy hardware. Uh, and, uh, but basically everything that we did, we funded ourselves. So it was a very gradual process. I know that it's easier if you go to a bank and loan some money or if you look for uh, an investor and things are easier. But for us, it was just a very gradual process and we just had organic growth. We didn't use any external funding. Thank you for your interesting lecture. Uh, I would like to ask you a question. Now, let's, let's hear the first question. No, no, no. Just, just, just. So, simple question also. Yeah. I'm working in the field of RFID, the technology which is helping to distinguish fake things of, from, from real things. Mm -hmm. So, could you hint me, or us, how looking at your pictures we can recognize which is real, which is not. We can. It's come to a point where you can't really tell which is real and which is not. That's why you got Oscar, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have one question. First of all, I would like to congratulate you for your very high award. Thank you. But uh, the question is, uh, which, what kind and which uh, known or unknown algorithms do you use in your project from a mathematical point of view or from computer science? They're, they're just, it's a long place. There's, there's, so, there's so many, like everything that you can imagine. So really, it's just, my most time my I have, a, I have a question. I have a question. Um, so, what you showed us is absolutely uh, immaculate. It's great work. Um, is there any way that we can um, read more about it or learn more about your achievements and, and especially your your platform and the website? Or is there any other um, any uh, free trial of, of the software in a small scale? In a small scale. Yeah, we have, a, we have a website. If you type Zira and Chaos Group, you will go to our website where you can download a, a trial version. It's for 30 days. But if you need more, we can extend it. You can play with it. We also have a forum that you can ask questions. So you're just very welcome to that. Thank you. Mr. Kolazov, uh, have you ever thought about how much money you have saved to the cinema industry? And how many opportunities you have given to the cinema industry to see movies?
is probably we would never see without your software and without your technology. Have you ever this been discussed in the cinema industry? And do they expect more from your products? They always expect more. They expect it for free as well. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have exact calculations on how much money they save by this. Um, obviously, there are some things that you can never do with a practical effect, like if you want to show a whole world or a whole galaxy or something like that, things in space, uh, magical creatures, nothing of that you could do practically, even if you tried. So, how do you put a price on that? Um, one thing is for sure, it always would have been a lot less interesting if we didn't have CG. So. That's all I know. But um, other people, our clients who actually deal with, who make the movies, probably can give a better answer on that. Congratulations, Mr. Kovazo. Uh, this is the cutting edge edge for uh, CG. Uh, we, as the users, we are using this Puree program because we are working in the design field, the uh, industrial design field. Uh, what I want to ask you, uh, have you seen and what exactly is the future for you? How do you see the future for Vray? Because this is the cutting edge now, but what about tomorrow? Because we don't oh, is it by new? We expect more. Yeah, I, know. I, I know you have some ideas. I have a lot of ideas, but I generally, I, I generally dislike this question because things change so fast that what I say yes. today will probably be totally wrong tomorrow. Exactly. What will probably happen is we're going to see a lot more uh, GPU rendering in the future because just GPUs are so much faster. And they will get faster, whereas CPUs are basically flatline um, right now. Um, other things that will happen is AI will be basically everywhere. We have a few research projects where we're researching how we can apply deep learning and deep neural networks in V-Ray. This is something that we will explore uh, more in the coming months until the end of the year. So this is where the future is. Thank you. Hopefully we'll get to the point where they can do all of our jobs. Department of Artificial Intelligence and Systems Engineering, Arica Technical University, Latin. Please, you are.
thank you that I am here today. Um, this is my first time in Bulgaria, and it is also my first time in Russia, of course. And this beautiful country with roses and uh, flowers, and the mood is like roses. What I'm going to talk about is this topic of continuous requirements engineering. And we just heard in the previous speech that it is sometimes so that uh, developers don't want to talk much with users. And that probably also it is not so easy to communicate. And uh, But practically there is much more in this. So therefore, we can think of this necessity to have the requirements understood requirements all the time. So it is continuous requirements engineering. Um, the agenda is the follows. I am not going to speak a long time. Uh, so therefore, maybe some topics I will just jump through. But uh, I have put these links everywhere. So in case you have some information which you need more information for a particular topic, then you can uh, come there and uh, look at it more, in more details. So the first thing uh, I'm talking about is Freedom Framework, which is the framework of uh, continuous requirement engineering which we have developed. And then I will move to practical implementations with respect to the continuous requirements engineering, which we have done in our university together with our students. And basically, uh, behind each of this work uh, topic, there is one master's thesis. And I will end uh, up with the uh, um, future work and a bit about our community of continuous requirements engineering. Uh, did you know that in both cities in Riga I come from and in Russia there are these monuments? Yeah. Uh, they, the, the title of the, uh, of the framework, it, it, it was not created with, with, the, with, the, with the purpose to resemble all these things, but um, these are just letters which, which form the title. However, the Freedom Framework is developed on the basis of a viable systems theory. And viable systems theory is about having continuously preserved identity. And this is something that we want for our countries, and this is also something that we want for our companies, enterprises, and our products. So therefore, we try to build a framework so that this identity can be preserved. Before we came up with the framework, we researched a lot how to do uh, requirements in the uh, systems which are viable systems. So the systems which can uh, live or can sustain themselves in the environment which is not predict predicted, which you don't know what will be tomorrow, and still you can preserve yourself in this not known tomorrow. Here you can see the basic elements of the freedom framework, and as you can see, this is future representation, reality representation, so we need to distinguish between these two things. Um, we have requirements engineering as a function. All of these, which you can see here, all these are functions. And uh, then we also have to decide how we are going to fulfill our requirements. So there is fulfillment engineering. And then there is design and implementation, operations, and management. All these are functions. You can see that they are related, but it doesn't mean that it is top-down way how we are working with these functions. So the framework has a kind of flexibility in the way that some of the functions can be integrated in one function. It also can have different, um, let's say, a range of change. So, flexibility. And let us now examine some possibilities of continuous requirements engineering. As the first thing I would like to show you is um, the method we have developed for continuous requirement engineering for mobile application development. This method is based on so-called federation, a model federation. You can see that there are um, a specific, a specific uh, types of models which are organized in a specific way. You can see there is some general space and other spaces which 
are used for requirements engineering. On the left, you can see the method, and on the right, you can see how these different spaces are interrelated um, when that method is applied. What you can see here is that there are several cycles in this method. So the first cycle is mainly uh, responsible for the granularity of the requirement. So this is kind of kind of thing that uh, we can have more abstract and less abstract requirements, and usually we have to go down to the level of detail which is implementable. And so when we have gone down to this level, then we can see. So we can see that in this method, one of the basic points is right <coughs> granularity of the requirement, and uh, the method was implemented with this Visual Studio and tested currently in one company. Uh, this company had really problems with uh, requirements uh, stages and requirements uh, organizing and uh, after, after implementation of this method, um, things became better. And there is also another approach, which is a bit maybe similar, but it is made especially for the requirements engineering when we are applying some everybody knows what is Scrum, right? So this is one of the most popular ways how digital products are developed. So here again, we had a company for which we developed, which we used as a, uh, let's say, a case company. What you see on the right side, there are things which the company wished to achieve with this. On the left, you can see what the theory gives. So this is like an integration of possibilities which are requirements engineering in general, in agile requirements engineering, and also in uh, the works which people have built for, uh, for requirements engineering for agile projects. So these things we organize together. And what you can see here, there is, there is some things which we found out. Of course, you cannot uh, cannot avoid uh, continuous communication and collaboration. This is necessary, and it is not just about technology. It is still also about people. Until it is so that the software is developed by people, still the communication will be needed. Maybe one day part of software will be really uh, developed by artificial intelligence. Yeah. Uh, next thing is. Um, that requirements have to be prioritized continuously. Things change, priorities change. Just in time specification, so that if you specify requirements, you specify the requirements only when it is needed, not just bulks of big specifications. Of course, it is necessary to have methods and tools for requirements change management, and also there is testing issue which is very important. On the right side, you can see the basic elements which were included in the method. And here in this picture, you can see how this method is implemented into the Scrum project. On the right side, also, there are artifacts which are developed by the method. And you see that these artifacts are common things. Uh, those people who are currently developing the software, most of them are common with, with all of these things. The question is not that we are proposing absolutely new article. The thing is that these articles have to be used in the right order. And in, on this slide you can see the workflow. The workflow of the work, how the requirement engineering work in the Scrum, in the Scrum project. Uh, the implementation of this method was uh, done by, um, by um, integrating two tools. One of them was Jira and another you can see how these two tools were integrated together, and the result was achieved there. Another case which I would like to explain here is the case about the continuous requirement engineering for IT startups. For startups, it is so that the startup usually goes through a single KPI, key performance indicator is found, and on the basis of this key performance indicator, the requirements are developed. Now this, again, is the method, 
and uh, you can see that this method p first p on the upper on the upper part on the upper part we are uh, ch choosing the indicator then the requirements go out then we build the system at, uh, according to the requirements see whether there is success or not and then either stay in the same stage or go to the next stage of the stack uh, for this method, there is also a developed web page where you can get acquainted with the method. And also in this method, for each uh, step, uh, the requirements engineering approaches for requirement solicitation are offered. They are based on research work on, on several uh, 63 approximate resources for, uh, for uh, requirements engineering. And the last, uh, but the, not the least maybe, this is um, the question about adoption of DevOps. I don't know how it is in Bulgaria. In Latvia, DevOps is a very, very, very uh, popular term. Uh, it means that developers and operations work together. You can see in this picture, which is continuous uh, software engineering, we have a biz dev and uh, DevOps. So DevOps, it's uh, operations and uh, developers work together. Uh, in our approach, we do, do not distinguish between biz dev and uh, DevOps. So this biz, uh, biz business side is also inside of this uh, development side. Uh, the method is as follows. If the company wants to adopt uh, this uh, DevOps approach, then it has specific uh, artifacts like for example questionnaires, on the basis of which it can estimate its current state with respect to the DevOps. And um, then it can also show where it would like to be. And uh, the method gives uh, uh, an advice what kind of DevOps uh, Devo practices and tools the company shall use. To come up with this method, there are quite many artifacts were developed. So for example, the Practices, DevOps practices were amalgamated from very, very many different sources. Also, the tools used in DevOps were found out. Uh, tools were organized in tool chains, and these tool chains were related to particular practices. And also, there was one more artifact which was developed. We had to develop the DevOps maturity model. And uh, this DevOps maturity model is based on a capability maturity model let's say grants, but uh, all information in it is uh, organized with respect to the DevOps. And also there were uh, metrics for DevOps found out because the metrics are needed to evaluate um, the, the state of the company with respect to the DevOps. The method which you can see here is available on the website with all the artifacts again. Uh, if somebody is interested, you can go there and you can you can use this material. Uh, the method, uh, the, the, the first part of the method here, um, here this part is when you start adoption process and when you continue, when going of uh, higher levels of maturity, then we uh, repeat uh, part of the method. So continuously can go to the higher levels of DevOps. So, this was about the, how it is today, what we are doing today. Uh, the question is what we are going to do in future. Uh, we have found out that uh, one thing which we have to relate it is continuity and complexity. Uh, one thing is that you have to do things continuously, but another thing is that more and more technologies are coming in and complexity is growing, and therefore there should be some methods how to, how to manage complexity. And uh, our next stages are continuous requirements engineering for heterogeneous distributed business and IT systems, which is also cloud computing. Currently, we have established um, together with German and uh, Finnish colleagues uh, two workshops, which is uh, continuous requirements engineering workshop. Uh, you can see the latest edition uh, in the website, where, where, which is shown there. There is also a managed com complexity workshop for which the latest edition is uh, still in, uh, in front of us. And if anybody of you wants to share your knowledge in how to handle complex complexity, uh, the deadline is July 
one, so you are really very much welcome. Uh, the, the workshop will be in Copenhagen at the end of August. And we also have a journal which is sponsored by uh, Riga Technical University. The journal is an um, open access journal and uh, many people from different countries are putting their uh, effort into it. Um, like voluntarily work, so we, just, we are not requiring uh, any, any price for publishing or reading. And uh, the journal is Complex Systems Informatics and Modeling Waterway. So this is basically, the, these are basically the things I wanted to share with you. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marita. Ladies and gentlemen, do you have any questions? Do you actually teach any of these methods to your software engineering courses to bachelor or master students, or currently it's just research to help companies? Um, we are teaching, like, for example, Scrum but uh, we don't teach these methods which I just presented yet because they, this is our latest, latest work. We finished them in 2016 and 2017. We are not yet teaching, but uh, in, in, in some point, probably we will also give a possibility for, stu for students to get acquainted with the methods. Therefore, we are developing also these websites so that this material which we are developing during this research would be available for everybody who needs it. Thank you. Other questions, please? If not, more questions. Thank you, Marie. Department of Computer Science, Winston Salem State University, USA. Please. and informatics where, uh, you know, uh, my dear colleagues uh, with which I still in touch and even we do some joint research. Now, well, uh, it's very difficult to give a talk after the talks that we already <laughs> listened, uh, which were so exciting because of the whole uh, you know, achievements of uh, our young colleague, which I'm particularly proud 
because it comes from our university, from our country, and he did it. Well, the thing is that not all our students are that enthusiastic as him and haven't been so willing to learn all these things. I was amazed of him saying that I would like to have learned and this and that and this and that. And I said, oh my gosh, why my students now are, <laughs> are not saying this? And I would say that uh, more, perhaps many of you here that teach would agree. We do have a problem. And the problem is that very often we don't have the students engaged. We would like to talk, we would like to teach them. We, you know, kind of all enthusiasm that we have. But they're bored, and they're like, you know, and you what are you going to do in this situation? So we do have a problem as instructors. This is my topic now. What we can do about this? One of the approaches of this, which is kind of a recent approach in the education, embraced in the educational community, is to apply what is called gamification. So my talk would be in basically trying to explain what is gamification, since this is a new term uh, coined only in 2010, and it's not an educational game, or not serious games. So people do not know, they just say gameful, that's gamification. Well, it's not. So I'll try to explain what it is. I'll try to explain the theoretical, the theory behind these concepts of why we believe that it will work. And then I will give an example of a platform which we are developing to support gamification of academic courses. Okay, so how to motivate our students? It's really, really difficult because of all these cool things that we have, social media, Facebook, Twitter, all the time. I don't know how are your students, but mine, when I start talking, they're just, you know, checking their emails or te texting, whatever, not email, even emails anymore, maybe texting all these things, games, whatever. And we have to compete with this to get their attention to get them involved, engaged in what we are doing in class, okay? For example, games. We all agree that they have remarkable motivational power. Just a few examples, and they are not recent, they are from 2010 publications. The players of World of Warcraft have spent 5.93 million years in the gaming, in the gaming environment play this game, or collectively our planet, the citizens of our planet spend 3 billion hours a week gaming. And they do that. Nobody forces them. Nobody asks them. But they start and they stick to this. And they play, <coughs> play, and play. Why? Can we do something that is similar so, <laughs> so that, you know, uh, benefit of such motivators that are present in games? That's the question. Apparently, games have some game mechanics, mechanisms, and elements that make the uh, players to play, to engage. And very often without any award, but just for the sake of the play and for the possibility of opportunity to win, right? Okay, so we know about this motivational uh, power of the games, and that's why, as you know, there are many educational games called also serious games that are very useful uh, to be used in class for teaching some particular skills or, or particular topics. <coughs> The problem is that it's very difficult to develop such a game, a professional game, like at that level. And so, we cannot develop for any single skill that we have to teach in our class, we cannot develop such. So what do we do? Well, one approach is to try to get some of the game mechanisms 
and try to incorporate them in our teaching. Okay. <laughs> so, try to incorporate them in our teaching. Well, that's the approach of gamification. That is, use of game design elements in contexts which are not games, in a non-game context, like, for example, in education or learning. If we look at the plane of all these things related to using game and game elements, you can see where is gamification, where are serious games, where are serious toys and playful design. Okay, on the axis, yeah, so on the x axis, actually, excuse me, just see, it's on, okay. So, on the x axis, you see here from full blown system to some elements of the software. And here, on the y axis, we have from playing to gaming. Now, in Bulgarian, play and game is the same, igra. However, these are two different concepts which are labeled with the same term. Because playful is not gameful. Playful is open-ended, improvising, uh, you know, fun. There's no restrictions. Uh, <coughs> when gaming, gameful, you have rule, they are rule-based. You have a target, so it's directed, it's competitive. So you can see that these are very different concepts. So that's why here is gamification on this square here. Elements of game design in games. Yes. Now, some of the design elements here we can see. Challenges and goals. Very fast feedback. Freedom to fail. In a game, you don't fail because you can compete. You, you can uh, continue, you can repeat until you get it, right? Until, until you get good in that. And so, also, status, exploits and leaderboards, leveling up, uncovering, badges, time constraints, competition, social engagement. All these are game design elements which can be used in the gamification. Although the term gamification is quite recent, it was coined only in 2010. But the principle is known before. And actually, many companies are using this very successfully in business and marketing. Uh, we all know about the frequent flyer points, right? But this is a form of gamification, that's it. You, you fly, you get points, you get some miles, and you get rewards. That's it, right? It's not a game. It's gamification. Marketing also, it's popular in politics, it's popular in uh, health and fitness. Why not in education? It's only recently when we started thinking, okay, if it's so successful in other domains, why we cannot use it in education, right? So, before looking at that, I'm sorry, what is actually that motivates a person to learn? Actually, motivation is a psychological category. And the psychologists offer different ways of looking or explain motivation. One of, the, one of the way to look at it is to look whether motivation comes from inside of the individual or from outside. In the first case, from inside, it's called intrinsic motivation. From outside is extrinsic motivations. What's the difference? In the case of extrinsic motivation, you are involved in some behavior or you are involved in some activity because you would like to gain to gain a war, like in this case, or to avoid the punishment. The carrots or the stick. <laughs> this is what psychologists say. Uh, that's extrinsic. Intrinsic motivation is when you do something for the benefit of doing, for, for the enjoyment of doing it, actually. So you, you don't expect anything from outside. You just in, you do the activity for itself because you are enjoying doing it. So that's the intrinsic motivation. 
Well, one of the most famous uh, theories uh, about motivation is that Maslow's uh, theory of needs. So motivation comes to satisfy certain needs that we have, right? So he has um, created this hierarchy of needs which go from the very basic needs like breathing, food, water, and go up. So you have to have set to satisfy all these needs to go to the next level. You can not have a <laughs> like a need to respect up to respect be respected by others if you cannot breathe or <laughs> are hungry, right? You don't uh, uh, bother about this. But this is how it goes. The bottom categories are called uh, D categories or deficiency needs, and the up are the B categories or the beings. And so the needs are something that we are missing and we have to satisfy in order to avoid unpleasant feelings. So that's what is a motivation or something, right? Okay, so in the modern society, uh, pretty much we consider that uh, pretty much the basic needs are satisfied, so uh, people are more motivated for a higher level uh, intrinsic motivators uh, like competence, autonomy and relatedness. That is why when we try to understand the motivation, particularly we have interested motivation in learning, we have to take into account and understand, consider the innate psychological needs for this. And how? Now, by saying this, we can see why actually games uh, are so addictive. Because they promote intrinsic motivation, which is an innate motivation. For example, games uh, offer problem solving, possibilities for problem solving, sense of progress, frequent feedback, and these are related to competence. Or here we have autonomy, related nerve center, experimentation, and so on and so forth. Relatedness, uh, the games offer sense of purpose, sense of goals, creating with meaning, social interactions. So here is how this motivator actually promotes the intrinsic motivation. That's why games are so powerful and motivating. How about the educational ga <laughs> gamification? <laughs> well, we know now what to look for. Educational gamification is related to st stimulating extrinsic and intrinsic motivators that can make learning more engagement. And if the learners engage more, they will have better academic achievements, of course. So that's the whole thing. Again, educational, uh, no, not gamification is not an activity. It is enhancement of activities. Okay, well, we know what it is now. So, what is the state of the art? You know, are there, uh, what do people do? Are our colleagues in the educational society are uh, kind of using this principle, are uh, gamifying their courses? In 2014, we uh, did a study uh, which was a systematic mapping study of gamification education uh, from the beginning of coining this term in 2010 to 2014 June, June. And then a year later, we did another study to see how the next year things were developed and where this new field is kind of going. Okay. Uh, and this is, uh, these are, uh, this is uh, research <coughs> which we've done with uh, some colleagues from the Academy of Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, Gale Angelova and uh, Gennady Legre uh, participated in the team. That was a joint work. Okay, so let's see what's happening. So here in this couple of slides, we have with uh, purple, uh, we have the period 
2010 to end of to, uh, to middle 2014 and with the green 14 to 2015. You can see how much for just one year, you know, from the 2010 when the term was coined to here we have that many publications, uh, that many works and empirical study published. We have uh, reviewed, on the previous slide it was uh, shown, we have reviewed IEEE uh, Digital Library, ACM Digital Library, Scopus, uh, Google Scholar, everything that you can, you know, find for such publish publications. It's, and this is all in 2015. Now it will be, <laughs> up to the sky, now it will be difficult to make such even uh, graphics. Okay, so the categorization, uh, the categorization criteria that we have used in the studies were the same, and we reviewed what kind of game elements uh, uh, our colleagues have used, what in what type of application, educational level, academic subject, implementation, and what they have uh, reported as results of these studies. Uh, so here we have a distribution of the, the empirical studies by gamification design principles. I'm not sure we can read, it's very small, uh, font here, so this is uh, goals and challenges. Here we have personalization, rapid feedback, uh, visual status, unlocking content, freedom of choice, freedom to fail, a storyline or identities, onboarding, time restrictions, social engagement, and surprise or prizes. As you can see, that most, mostly, you know, we have visible, uh, visible status and social engagement are the most and rapid feedback, the most used gamification design principles. Then, if we look at the distribution of the works by game, mecha by, uh, game mechanisms, we see points, badges, and leaderboards are most, the most uh, used. You even uh, meet uh, the acronym PBL, which stands for points, badges, leaderboards, which is very largely used. But you can also see the tendencies of uh, uh, how the things are developing. For example, in the second study, we found the avatars are pretty much already uh, used uh, well as well. By the type of applications, we see that most of the studies and applications have been done in the uh, courses which have blended learning uh, and also in e-learning sites or learning environments. Uh, and you can see that they initially there were uh, courses without support of online, uh, online support, but uh, with the time this category just disappears. And finally, the work uh, distribution. You see, uh, you see that the gamification has been applied, well, either to a range of activities in a course, learning activities, uh, or immediately after that is applied to exercising and assignments to uh, gamify these particular um, learning uh, activities. Okay. Now, reported results. In the, in the beginning, in the first survey, you see that, uh, so this is uh, positive results, these are negative, these are inconclusive which means how the, the teams that have been doing these uh, empirical studies say whether gamification is useful, have been useful in their context or not. Uh, we can see that uh, in the beginning, mostly we had a positive and uh, very, not that much in, inconclusive, uh, but a lot of not evaluated uh, studies, not properly evaluated. However, uh, in the second, the following study, we see that we have a big deal of inconclusive studies. Why is that? Well, for one thing, initially there was the initial hype about this gamification. So everybody would do some small thing and say, oh yeah, it works <laughs> to get published, you know, to manage gamification. And well, with, uh, with uh, getting more serious, uh, more serious research in the field, we uh, now see that uh, the authors are more careful in uh, applying, uh, in reporting whether it works in a particular situation. 
Now, what is the conclusion of this study? The conclusion is that gamification education is still a very rapidly growing phenomenon. However, the feeling is that the practice of gamifying learning has outpaced researchers understanding how actually uh, the mechanism and method of gamification works, which means that many more empirical studies <coughs> have to be done in order to isolate this reason for success or the reasons for failure of applying gamification in particular context and with particular uh, student group or learners group. However, to do that, we have to have actually some support. Instructors have to have software tools that support them to gamify their courses, because otherwise it's very, this is very difficult to do. And this course gamification platform, one up, comes as a one life up. In the games, you, you have the ne your next life. <laughs> That's one up game. Uh, so we are using, um, we have adopted vocabulary of game technology. Um, so learning objectives in the course are skills. Uh, the tests and quizzes are challenges, the questions are problems, and we do uh, employ gamification techniques, mechanisms, in order to try engaging and motivating students. Um, the problems that uh, can be supported, it's subject independent. It's not like a game that the game is, that is created for this particular skill and this particular problem, and you are playing it until you get it. No. The instructors should actually enter the exercises or the challenges and the problems. The problems that we support are static, which are the uh, traditional true-false, multiple choice, multiple answer or matching questions, and dynamic, which are uh, parameter, parameter, parameterized templates from which we can generate instances and automatically grade this. All problems have to be automatically great because we have to have immediate feedback, which is very important as in the game context. Also, the second uh, kind of problems are programming problems where students are given a, a problem and they write code, a segment of code or a whole, a whole program, and this is uh, checked for correctness by running it uh, with our, in our system uh, by using uh, test uh, test programs from uh, which are given by the instructor. So uh, again, automatic checking of the assignments. Uh, the elements that we are employing are avatars, agreeing points, progress bars, leadership badge, uh, leaderboard badges, labeling, unlocking content, virtual currency, and immediate uh, feedback. The most important thing: is that <coughs> the instructor can configure what they want to use. They can say, I'm using badges, I'm not using leaderboard. They can say, no, I don't want badges, I'm using virtual currency. So it's fully configurable, so that uh, depending on the group uh, which is using this and, the, uh, and you know, the willingness of the instructor and the students, uh, it can be configured. Now, I'm finishing with giving some slides with screenshots this system, just to give you a feeling of what it is, a platform. Uh, this is the, a course, uh, a course uh, page in the system for a particular course. In this case, it's the data structures course. Uh, here you can see the leaderboard. Uh, here we have the X points. So these are the top, the top performers in the class. Uh, everybody has an avatar, of course, so that you don't know <laughs> who they are. So that's some. Um, Students are not upset that they are not <laughs> there. Uh, you have the skill points. The, again, the top achievers for each particular skill which is targeted in that course, you have the different badges as well. Another uh, screenshot is from your course shop. Now, we, we have implemented virtual currency, so the instructor states rules how students can earn course bucks and how they can spend them. So they start with something and they can learn. For example, if they have uh, you know, uh, full points on a test, they get 
say five bucks or something. So the instructor has the you know the freedom to, to say what they appreciate and how they can spend them as well. For example, in our example here, you can the the, <coughs> the student can buy, for example, an extension for an assignment, twelve hours extension <laughs> for five bucks or <laughs> for to twenty four twenty four hour extensions, or they can get a hint. They have to pay, but they have to pay, they have to have earned that, right? So it, everything's connected. Uh, so this is about uh, virtual currency. And finally, uh, this is a screenshot which visualizes the achievements of a student, where the students see, uh, you know, all the skill points for each skill of the course that they have received. These are the uh, serious challenges, these are the practice or warm-up challenges. And you have the bar, the progress bar, where it shows all the points uh, earned by now, by this point. Then this in the red are points that they have already lost because they haven't got uh, on the quizzes or whatever uh, full points. And so the interesting, this, the yellow one, are the points that they still can get from the upcoming assignments. <coughs> the thing is that the system say, if you continue to perform as you are doing now, then you get at the end of the course right here. What is that? 59. Not good enough to pass the course. So you better, <laughs> you better start doing something, if you like, in a month or two months to pass the course. Well, basically, this is it. The conclusion, we can say that empirical research is still inconclusive because more research and uh, empirical studies are needed. However, we have believed that by developing this platform, which are developing, we will give the tool to the instructors to do these studies and to set gamification